Kings. I'll try not to sneeze into my microphone so long as it's on. Second Kings. And will you please find chapter 18 when you find Second Kings? We're going to be primarily actually in Isaiah chapter 38-39 this evening, but I want to introduce us to another man in our series on good examples of bad examples. And this series has to end. It's got to come to an end sometime soon. But it's been a lot of fun, hasn't it? I've uh, really enjoyed preaching it. And it's something just a little bit different, a little new, as far as the style of preaching that I normally do. But I felt that it's very, very important for us to really kind of deal with a mindset that oftentimes we have as believers, where we adopt notions that it happened in the Bible and therefore God wanted it or it was good. And so we have some phrases, some things that we say that actually when you think about them, particularly sometimes if you ever talk to somebody who's new in the faith and just hasn't grown up using phrases like we use in churches a lot of times, you get a little bit of a fresh perspective. And so people will say, it happened in the Bible, for instance. It happened in the Bible. You ever think about that from like a child's perspective? Like it happened in the Bible? And, uh, you know, people are thinking, we're thinking, you know, it happened... In other words, it was recorded in the Scripture that this happened. And we think of Bible times as well, which would be a rather vague window of time, actually beginning, I guess, from creation until about 2,000 years ago, so almost all of time known to man. And so when we say it happened in the Bible, that would be the scope uh, chronologically of the time that would be referenced. It's kind of funny. But when you think of it from a kid's perspective, you're thinking of these little tiny people, you know, while you're sleeping who are awake running around in the Bible doing things. And so it happened in the Bible or in Bible times. No, it's not little people in the Bible. These are actual people, and it's historically recorded in, the, in an eternal book that has no error. But oftentimes we think because, quote, it happened in the Bible, that God endorses it. In other words, you know, this is a, this is a person who knew God, and he did it. And so it must be okay. Uh, I think that while I was praying over this series, one of the things that made an impression on me was listening to a preacher that I actually know preaching on the matter of marriage. And one of the things that he said was that, well, you know, in Bible times, they had, you know, polygamy. And it was okay then. And so, and I just thought, oh, the pain <laughs> of, uh, but you know, there are a lot of things actually like that. That would be a for instance. But there are a lot of things that we think because it's recorded in the scripture that God put a stamp on it and said, okay, this is okay. Or I use this, this is all right. Just because it happened and it's recorded in the scripture doesn't mean that it was holy and that God was okay of it, with it. Matter of fact, polygamy is rather soundly dealt with in the record of first marriage, the first record of marriage. Two becoming one flesh, that's pretty clear, isn't it? If it isn't clear enough, Jesus' clarification of it in Matthew ought to be good enough for us. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of times people think that because it happened, then it was endorsed by God. The, the, most, recent, the most recent, for instance, we looked at, I think a couple of good ones we looked at, uh, would have been Balaam. Man, Balaam was a great example, good example, a bad example, in a lot of ways. And he is actually, in the Scripture, one of the most famous good examples of bad examples. He is sort of like the Benedict Arnold of the Scripture, Balaam is. And he really is. He's referred to in the New Testament and the Old Testament over and again because of, of the mindset, the bad example that he was in spite of what he had. And then uh, we saw, for a good example of a bad example, recently Ahithophel. And we saw a man that though he would have certainly been relatable to in his bitterness and in his anger, frustration, to the point where he killed himself, even though we could relate to him, he's a good example of a bad example of unforgiveness. We looked at Job's three friends, and then the young man that oftentimes we forget about in Job. And a couple of things we were reminded about was that just because it's a verse in the Scripture doesn't mean it's quoted in a righteous context. A lot of wise sayings or a lot of verses that believers quote from the Scripture are actually quoted uh, from or quotes of Job's three friends who were wrong about everything they said. 
And so their wisdom actually is immediately refuted by God. Uh, after they've quoted it, and then we go and quote the scriptures, the things that they say, like man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward and so forth. And so uh, these are good examples of bad examples. And I think this has been a helpful series, won't you agree, for us just to uh, not become, when we use the word critical, we don't mean in the sense of criticize the word of God, but be, being discerning in our thinking, becoming critical thinkers. And realizing if this doesn't make sense, it's probably because it makes no sense. And so God doesn't endorse some things. God's against many things in, the, in His Word. And just because you see someone doing it does not mean that God says, okay, well, happened in the Bible. And so even though it seems to contradict my character and my commands, it'll be okay. It isn't at all. I want to look at one this evening. And this man is, much like King David for me, a man about whom I'm very... Uh, ambivalent and who seems to be rather much of an enigma. Ambivalent means it's one of those guys you can't figure out whether you love him or hate him. You know, he's kind of I've kind of got it with with uh, Hezekiah, our king, this evening. I sort of have a a uh, Hezekiah, you're the best guy ever, and then Hezekiah, I can't stand you. Why'd you do that? And so he's kind of got a got both in, in my mind, and he's an enigma because. He was one of two kings in Israel who separated themselves by their behavior which pleased God from all the other kings, particularly in Judah. And yet he's one of the kings in Judah who did a lot of harm uh, to his own nation and country. And so I want to look at those things. We'll focus primarily on the bad example, but we'll read about the good example so that we don't vilify a fellow that I'm certain will have more rewards in heaven than I do. Okay, so we'll put it that way. And by the way, can I qualify all of these messages that way? Any of our bad examples who are in heaven, I don't know how they stand before God. I just don't know. I, I try not to comment about this last week, and actually I didn't. Um, but I was frustrated last week by all the Billy Graham opinions, weren't you? Is anybody here just bothered by all the opinions people had about Billy Graham last week? Uh, when Billy Graham died, a lot of people said... He's in heaven, he has major eternal rewards. And then when Billy Graham died, other guys were saying, I'm 100% sure that Billy Graham will spend eternity in hell. Uh, those are the gamut of opinions about. The fact of the matter is, I don't have a clue about Billy Graham, to be quite honest with you. I personally am acquainted with many individuals who heard the gospel clearly, plainly preached by Billy Graham and came to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. I've also personally read writing by Billy Graham, and I've also listened to interviews where Billy Graham has undermined the very gospel that he plainly preached by saying uh, that Jesus is the only way for eternal life for him, but that you know he can't imagine that God would possibly reject a Catholic or a devout Muslim or a, uh, something like that. And he, he completely diluted the entire message that he preached when he would thunder from the pulpit saying that Jesus is the only way. Well. The fact of the matter is, is that I don't have a clue what God thinks about Billy Graham. I know this. If you're going to count individuals who have been influenced by the gospel, the world doesn't know Ryan Price. And so, <laughs> he certainly, as far as I can tell, has been much, greater, much more greatly used and much more effective. But again, the Lord doesn't see as man sees. And so I don't know about Billy Graham. And the fact of the matter is, is that I don't know what would cause a man to compromise and to say the things that he had said. I don't have any idea. Perhaps it could be that uh, all along he was pretending to be a believer and he was not. Do you know who knows the answer to that question? God does and Billy Graham does. God and Billy Graham are very, very well aware of the truth of the matter and I have not a clue. I have no idea. So I don't have an opinion about it. In case you saw my Facebook post last week saying I have no opinion on that subject, that's the subject I had no opinion about, just in case you didn't know. So my cryptic messages have been revealed. Okay. Well, the fact is, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that Hezekiah is one of these guys. But I, let me just say, I'm not trying to vilify when I preach good examples of bad examples. I'm saying these individuals are examples for us. And we ought to gain 
by a good example, or we ought to gain in the same way by a bad example, oughtn't we? Mm-hmm. Or so if somebody does wrong and God's work condemns it, we ought to gain from that. And if somebody does right and God's work and God's word affirms it or, or uh, praises it, then we ought to learn by it. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get introduced to our man Hezekiah, and we'll read verses 1 through 3 of chapter 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Eliah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. I said verses 1 through 3, let's cheat and let's read verses 4 and 5. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves. Hey, do you know where this was at? And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Well, let's pray, and we'll ask the Lord to help us now as we go to the bad example of Hezekiah. Father, please help us this evening with both our understanding and, Lord, our attitude as well. God, for any person who would stand in judgment of an individual that the Bible says there was no one like before or after in the way that they pleased you or lived for you, God, we certainly would be very remiss and very wrong to stand in judgment. And yet, Father, there are things to be gleaned from Hezekiah's bad example. And so I pray that you'll help us to do so with the spirit of humility this evening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what about that statement in verse 5? There was nobody like him. There was none like him uh, among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were at before him. Verse 6 really sheds a little light on that. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from the following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. The Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. If you were to read chapter 18, chapter 19, you would see that God actually used this man to reverse a negative trend in Judah. Literally, Judah had come under bondage, uh, had come under bondage of the Philistines and the Assyrians. Judah had become just like the heathen nations in that she set up groves, she worshipped idols, and Hezekiah was a king who... Don't sneeze in the microphone, it isn't good for it. That's it. I think the battery died. Yeah, battery's dead. Taj will fix it. Okay. It was the battery all along. It wasn't my sneeze. <laughs> so Hezekiah was, and I, I forgot where I was at when I, when I heard the pop. Where was I? Thank you, Tosh. Chapters 18 and 19. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in chapter 18 and 19, you will see that Hezekiah was used by God to deliver him from the Assyrians. And actually, uh, Rabshika, you remember this, that guy Rabshika that came and spoke and in front of everybody on the wall actually had the audacity to say, you know, don't trust in Hezekiah. Right in front of him spoke, spoke in the language of the children of Israel and said, don't trust Hezekiah. He can't save you. If he tries to save you, you're all going to die. And threatened him, and Hezekiah fell on his face before the Lord, and and God uh, told Isaiah, who would have been the prophet at the time of Hezekiah, don't be afraid of him, God's going to deliver you, and God really single-handedly delivered Hezekiah. Now Hezekiah, though he would have followed and loved the Lord in the way of David his father, or great, you know, great, 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 great grandfather, though he would have done so, was nothing like David in how he uh, was used to lead Israel out from bondage. David was a guy that wasn't afraid to physically say, "Who are you to defy the armies of the living God? I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat your, uh, I'm gonna eat your lunch. I'm going after you right now." Hezekiah, when he was threatened, would fall on his face and cry his eyes out. <laughs> I mean, he David is this warrior who said, "You know what? I belong to the living God, and you mess with him, you're messing with me, and you better run because I'm about to get you." Hey, David's a guy no one in the world would want to take on King David. King Hezekiah, you could threaten him and he'd cry. 
He really, I mean, that, that's the difference in their personality. But effectively, the same thing happened. In other words, David, David would, would uh, he'd cry out to God, but he'd go after whoever and he'd fight. Hezekiah would cry and fall on his face and say, Oh God, what am I going to do? And God would deliver him. But the effect is the same because it was the God of David and the God of Hezekiah that gave them the victory, who delivered them. And so there, there isn't very much you can say about Hezekiah except that he was one of only two kings in Israel who ever put away the high places. Only two kings in all of Israel and Judah ever put away the high places. And Hezekiah even had the audacity to break up the brass serpent that had existed from the time that the children of Israel had wandered in the wilderness. And I don't know about you, but I somewhat regret that. When I think of that brass serpent, I think I'd like to see that thing. You ever wondered what it actually looked like? Does it really look like what we see on the side of an ambulance or on the doctor's office? Or what did the brass serpent look like? I mean, if you think about it, it was a figure of the cross, the brass serpent was. It was literally a picture of the cross. And I've seen before, I don't know where, I'd like to, to make some, but I've seen before the picture of the serpent and then the shadow of it falling and you're seeing the shadow of the serpent on on the on the pole actually looking you know casting the shadow of the cross and it's a pretty cool picture and that really is what it was it was a figure it was a, it was a shadow of the thing to come which was Jesus Christ being lifted up on the cross and the faith being the necessary uh, action in order for the cross to have effect or for the healing effect of the of God because of faith in the serpent anyways there was nothing wrong with the brass serpent. And by the way, if you study high places in the Scripture, high places are actually just places where uh, men who love God met God. But they came to be symbolic for their own sake instead of because of what happened there when individuals met God. And I am for tearing down high places. I'm for tearing down high places. I think there's a certain point in time... Don't, don't take this the wrong way. But there's a certain point in time when we, when we need to just forget about what God did back in, our, in the years of our fathers. Because so many times when you try to preach, I, I've run into this as a young preacher, now getting to be an old preacher, I've run into trying to preach about what God can do and having people come and tell me what God did. And that's no good for today. And that's no good for tomorrow. Sometimes our high places, our memorials or events, I think for Baptist churches that have Hall of Fames, go through and tear down the plaques. If, if, if they have eternal... Uh, I'm sorry, if, they, if they've done things that have mattered for eternity, God's got it well recorded. We don't need to record it. Sometimes we look up to men. We look up to events. Sometimes it's even a uh, building. Sometimes it's whatever it is. Sometimes I think we just need to tear them down. Just get rid of those things because we worship those things more than God. And so they're high places. And so Hezekiah was a guy that really had that down. I've spoken more about that than I wished to. But I hope I made the point that I'm not down on this man. Uh, he certainly, again, would be one of those individuals that for me, I, I wouldn't compare myself with in a positive light. I wouldn't say that I've ever done anything like Hezekiah has done. Will you please go to Isaiah chapter 38, being mindful that Isaiah would have been the prophet in Hezekiah's day. And so if you'll go to chapter 38, we'll look at Hezekiah. And I want to just look at some areas where I believe that the Scripture is actually giving us Hezekiah for a bad example. In verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 38, the Bible says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And of course, this is why I call Hezekiah this. I cry him the crybaby, call him the crybaby, and Hezekiah wept sore. Everything Hezekiah did, everything God said to Hezekiah or anybody said to Hezekiah made the man cry. Now, there's nothing in the Bible anywhere that says a man oughtn't to cry, okay? But I just was raised by the John Wayne generation, folks, so you've got to be sympathetic to me here, okay? When you were a kid, if you cried, your parents made fun of you when you were my age. Your parents were like, I cry, baby, you know? 
and uh, trying to shame you out of crying. That's, I know you guys, you, uh, you millennials, you can't believe it. But that's the way it was back in the day. That's, that's the real world, the real life. And that's the way our parents were. They're like, what, are you crying? Well, let me get a picture of that so I can show all the girls you cry like a girl. Okay, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I've been known to pop a tear every now and again, as Rodney would say. So I'm not above crying myself, but I only cry for the best of reasons. And so it's not my thing. I'll be honest with you. One of the last things that, that uh, I am comfortable with is men whining and men crying. And here he's just blubbering. I'd be mean, just to be as honest about it, if you'll allow me the freedom to say so, understanding I still like Hezekiah. But here he's just sobbing his little eyes out. And God's told him, set your house in order. You're not going to live. You're going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he just threw a little tantrum. He just, ah, 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 and he just cried until he could cry no more. And uh, then he said, God, or first he said, God, you know, I'm the perfect king. I've done everything right. I've, you, my heart's been perfect towards you. And I thought I would get to live forever because of that. And that really is kind of, when you read in the text this evening, kind of one of the things that you see. It's almost as though Hezekiah has mistakenly believed, because he's been perfect before God with his heart, that for some reason that he is deserving of something from God in a way that perhaps is exceptional. And here's a couple of things I want to just remind us about before we examine it more closely. First, first, God is the one who appoints us the days of our life. God is the one who appoints us the number of the days of our life. I've used this quite a few times because it left such an impression on me. But this last year, my great aunt, who died at 100 years old, got saved weeks before she died. And one of the things that's impressed me about that is, is really all about God. The first thing that's impressed me about it is how merciful God is. How merciful God is and how true it is that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the second thing that impressed me is that anybody who has been a child of God for two weeks could have as many rewards in heaven as she does, in spite of her having 100 years on this earth. Now, we had 10 family members saved at her funeral. And that was one of the things she wanted to be testified of. But it's kind of tragic that she had about two weeks of living for Jesus. Isn't it? It's a testament to the mercy of God, but it isn't really much for a person to brag about. When you look at individuals throughout history that it's apparent God has greatly used, it's amazing how actually small the scope of effectiveness in their life oftentimes is. You find actually, when you think of individuals, don't, don't hate me for this. I don't, I, I don't like this guy, okay? I'm just, just, our family has people named after him. But you know John Calvin? I know, you don't, don't take me out of context. I'm not a Calvin fan, folks, at all. But my dad's name is John Calvin. So that's what I'm talking about. No, actually, uh, no, seriously. Uh, the John Calvin, the reformer, uh, did you know he was 27 years old by the time he completed most of his, uh, most of his writings and most of, the, most of the major events in his life had taken place by the time he was 27 years old? By the way, don't read Theology of a Guy under the age of 27. But, uh, <laughs> but did you know that? And in other words, after that, pretty much everything he did was just to uh, murder Jews and and uh, wreck people's lives. Uh, most of the things that he did that actually were pretty good were all by the age of 27. And the same is true of most of the reformers, actually. A lot of people lived a long time after they did something, but most of what they did was after they were young. Boy, you can, you can talk of a lot of the uh, evangelists that were used, and usually the scope of their ministry oftentimes was shorter than five years, even though the, the effect was very, very broad, was very vast. The scope of their ministry, the, the chronological amount of time, was very, very narrow. And I want to just suggest that it is rather possible that God could do a lot with your life in a short amount of time, and that if that isn't happening in your life, a lot of what's happening isn't much of anything. 
I have no idea how I stand before the Lord. I have for, I would say, most of my life been very, very conscious of the, of the reality that what I do in this life matters for eternity. And eternal rewards has been a part of my conscious thinking for most of my life, but I actually don't know what counts for Christ. You know, Jesus said many times that if we do things to be seen of men, then we have our reward when men see it, essentially. And uh, we're all guilty of that to some degree. And I don't know how many things that I've told people about and just lost my eternal reward on. God does. He knows about that. But the number of years that I live really doesn't matter when it comes to the reality that I have eternal life. Why does it matter if I live to be 120 or if I live to be 40? If I have eternal life and if God says, okay, I need to remove you. I'm thinking this morning of how we looked at John the Baptist and how that John the Baptist, by the time he was 30 years old, God was done with him. And actually, in order for Christ to increase, John the Baptist had to decrease and for him to do a good job of decreasing, being off the scene entirely was the most effective way. And you know about the perfect number of years for John to live was about 30. About 30 years old. And if he lived longer than that, he could have gotten in the way of what God was doing because God had used him greatly. And if you had followed John the Baptist, you wouldn't have followed Jesus. You see where I'm coming from here this evening as we look at Hezekiah? God told Hezekiah, time for you to go, buddy. And he had a good record up to that time. And the fact is, is if that were all that was written, Hezekiah put away the high places he destroyed the brass serpent that was called, whatever that was called, and he did all these things, and then he died. You'd say, wow, 25 years old, did all that by the time he was 30? What a great life. What an impact he had in the nation of Judah at the time. And you'd have nothing but wonderful things to say about Hezekiah's life. Okay, go to chapter 39, will you please? Uh, Oh, wait, wait, I didn't finish telling you Hezekiah didn't have to live. Okay, so he cries a little bit. Verse 13, let's just jump down to verse 13 of chapter 38. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I just don't like it when guys talk like this. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward. Oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. And he goes on, and he's, he's promised that he's going to live. In verse 21, we see what he's saying. For Isaiah had said, Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. So God gave Isaiah another message. Take a lump of figs, make a plaster, put it on the boil, and Hezekiah, verse 22, asked for a sign. Hezekiah also had said, What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? And so God gave him a sign. Now, in verse 39. At that time, Merodach, Baladon, Baladon, the son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. That rascal. Yeah. Now, who did these treasures actually belong to? Hezekiah or God? Well, really, God is God's nation, right? In particular, the things in the house of the Lord. And so in verse 3, then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said to him, What said these men? From whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They're come down from a far country unto me from Babylon. Oh, friends, right? Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that's in mine house have they seen. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. One thing about it is he is without guile. Yeah. He, he was not trying to cover up. Uh, he said, I showed him everything. It was just, we had a great time together. Then said he, then said verse 
5, Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold the days that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon, nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that, they, that shall issue from thee, which they shall, thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Well, I don't know about you, but that's pretty serious business. And by the way, fall down and cry, Hezekiah. I mean, if you're going to be a crybaby, here's where you cry. You cry when you haven't been perfect before the Lord with all your heart. You cry when you do something that costs both your children and future generations and destroys the testimony of God. That's when you grieve. That's when you cry. My friend, I have to say that one of the frustrating things for me about Hezekiah is that he cried the wrong time. He didn't know when to cry. I'm serious. I'm not being silly about it. I'm silly about men crying and that sort of thing. But I'm not kidding when I tell you Hezekiah should have been crying here. And he should not have been crying when God told him he was going to take him home when he walked perfectly before God all his days. See, crying is what you do when there's a regret. Crying is what you do when there's something to be sorrowful for. And for an individual that has eternal life, my friend, there's nothing to be sorrowful for when you lose it as pertains to this life. But when it comes to the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, and when it comes to losing something and doing something which has eternal ramifications, that ought to grieve us. And I'd expect a guy that cries all the time to fall down and cry. I mean, when he heard Rabshika come and threaten, he fell on his face and he sobbed. When he heard that he was going to die at an early age, in spite of the fact that he'd been faithful to the Lord, he turned his face to the wall and he sobbed. But when he betrayed his nation and his own children, and God sent Isaiah, he said, no big deal. Look at this. In verse 8, Then said Hezekiah to, God, to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Moreover, here's why, For there shall be peace and truth in my days. He was a millennial before they invented them. <laughs> as long as it doesn't hurt me, I'll be alright. As long as it doesn't affect me, as long as it doesn't cost me, it's okay because it's all about me. And here we find Hezekiah's one big weakness. His major weakness wasn't that he didn't have a tender heart, wasn't that uh, he, you know, he was excessively prideful. His major weakness wasn't that instead of going out to battle like David did, that he'd, he'd cry and beg God to do something. None of those were his actual weaknesses. Hezekiah's actual weakness is that it grieved him when he'd suffer personally, but it didn't grieve him when he caused others to fall and to suffer. He said, the word of the Lord's good. That's all right. That's all right with me. Fair enough. As long as I don't suffer in my days, who cares about my children? He lacked courage. You could see it, actually, when you read about him in 2 Kings. You could see Hezekiah lacked courage. You say, you know, this is not a guy that I would put the label of courageous on. But you know, you can get by without courage if you just depend on God. But you know, courage oftentimes manifests itself as a deeper issue, a selfish issue. I don't think that any person who's exceptionally brave is brave because they enjoy pain, that they revel in danger, or that insurmountable odds are something which thrills their soul. I believe that individuals that are courageous believe in a cause that's bigger than themselves, greater than themselves. Courage is something that's lacking today, perhaps more than anything else, with exceptions, of course. Courage was lacking in Broward Sheriff's Office last week, sadly enough, isn't it so? Courage was lacking by the teacher that locked his students out of the classroom last week and wouldn't let them in, and then went on the media and bragged about it, about how brave he was. 
Courage is lacking when the sheriff in Broward County got on uh, the media or got on television and grandstanded about how great a job he had done and how wonderful he was when actually his department has been cowardly from the top down for several years. It's lacking. It's lacking in our society. Courage is lacking in our churches. When individuals are living in sin and nobody does anything about it, nobody mourns, nobody stands up to a sinner, no one says, this is wrong and this needs to be made right. It's lacking. Amen. It's lacking. Courage is lacking. You could just, just sweep a broad picture and you could paint it and you could say, we do not have courage. There's not many Joshua and Caleb types around anymore. Guys that say, yeah, they're big, but uh, not that big. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, the, 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 the odds are insurmountable except for we have God. Yeah, they may kill us, but the cause is worth dying for. And actually, courage was lacking in Hezekiah's day. Tragically enough, a man who was one of only two kings in Israel who actually put away the high places and destroyed the idols. One of only two kings to do that. The guy who is the only king to finally say enough's enough when people are worshiping a brass snake on a pole and put that away. The man didn't have enough courage to say to Babylon, no, you don't have any business going in the temple of the Lord. And then it didn't even bother him that he sacrificed his children's future in a terrible way. Because he didn't have to see it in his lifetime. And as long as he didn't have to see it, it wasn't really a problem. And so because of that, our good king Hezekiah, one of the best kings in Israel, is also on the list of good examples, of bad examples. Father, please help us to see this bad example and help us to note it and help us to see the appropriate things to mourn for and the inappropriate things to mourn for. And help us to be not like this man who counted his life here more dear than the lives of others and more dear than the eternal ramifications. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your good attention tonight. You're dismissed.